In referring to his classical education, Thomas Jefferson once said, I think myself more indebted to my father for this than for all the other luxuries his cares and affection placed within my reach. In the West, classical education was the primary method of education from its beginnings in ancient Greece until the 20th century. Up until 50 years ago, it was the primary method of education in the United States, where it was often called a liberal education because it was based upon the liberal arts. Socrates was the first of many key figures. He believed democracy could not function without wise and virtuous citizens. He was very interested in searching for the truth by asking questions in order to reveal fallacies, and he encouraged the practicing of virtues. Plato followed Socrates. He played a role in establishing an academy where he posed problems to be studied and solved by others, including ones in math and science and philosophy. He as well stressed justice and goodness. Following Plato was Aristotle. He established a lyceum school where he would lecture on subjects including natural history and philosophy. In the same tradition, he stressed goodness and virtue as a part of everyday life. He laid the foundation for formal logic. In the 4th century, Augustine brought classical and liberal education to a wider audience. He encouraged the use of the Greek trivium, which included grammar school, logic, and rhetoric. Capella followed in Augustine's footsteps. He played an important role by putting all seven liberal arts in a single volume and presented them in a condensed form that was widely acceptable to medieval readers. Cassiodorus was a Roman senator and was influential in transforming a monastery into a school. He helped make liberal arts a standardized part of education, grammar, logic, composition, languages, oratory, math, music, and classic literature were all part of the rigorous curriculum. After a period of dormancy, in the 11th century, liberal education once again began to reemerge as educators focused on reason, nature, and aesthetics. In the 14th century, as the Renaissance flourished, classic liberal education began to be taught beyond the elite intellectuals. In 1635, Boston Latin, the first public school in America, is founded. The original settlers of the Massachusetts Bay Colony believed that the success of a democratic society depended upon how they educated their children. They started the school to ensure their children had the tools needed for self-government. In 1776, five Boston Latin alumni signed the Declaration of Independence, including Benjamin Franklin, Samuel Adams, and John Hancock. Apart from those attending Boston Latin, almost all the other signers had a classical education. In 1778 and 1780, Thomas Jefferson introduced a bill that would have established the first general public school system in the nation. He proposed it to ensure that self-governance would be successful, focusing on accumulation of knowledge, character, and civic education. Through the 19th century and into the mid-20th century, a typical liberal education at the primary and secondary level in the U.S. embraced the study of classic literature, great books, writing, composition, and languages, as well as core knowledge of history, science, math, and English. By the mid-20th century, classic liberal education was being met with significant resistance, and by the late 20th century, it had all but faded away in popularity. But hope remained, and since the 1990s, charter, magnet, and private schools have begun to bring back classical education. Recently, a growing number of charter and traditional public schools have begun offering this type of education again with impressive results. The goal of classical education is to train the mind, and this process finds its foundation in the seven liberal arts. 
literature, philosophy, language, science, history, mathematics, and fine arts. In a fast-paced world that's changing rapidly, ironically, classical education is more relevant today than it ever has been before. The computer would simplify decision-making. Well, in fact, what's happened? The computer does simplify decision-making, but it complexifies everything else, so you have to make more complex decisions anyway. The computer as a source of complexity, as well as a machine for dealing with complexity, has not yet been fully understood. I've said this before, I thought it was worth repeating. It's in Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough. That it's technology married with liberal arts, married with the humanities, that yields us the result that makes our hearts sing. Twenty years after my own graduation, I have come gradually to understand that the liberal arts cliché about teaching you how to think is actually shorthand for a much deeper, more serious idea. Learning how to think really means learning how to exercise some control over how and what you think. It means being conscious and aware enough to choose what you pay attention to and to choose how you construct meaning from experience. Because if you cannot exercise this kind of choice in adult life, you will be totally hosed. Now the digital age also, it comes at us so fast and in such a great pace that we, you know, that we really wonder whether it does inspire that time for reflection, that time for us to think, that time for us to truly wonder and to look forward. Well, those kinds of things, that effort to try to inspire wonder and to explore and to learn, those things are the essence of a liberal education. And a liberal education is an education for freedom, an education that allows one to speak and to think for oneself, to not be constrained by prevailing wisdom, by fad or fashion to be truly free and to think for oneself. There are major disruptions happening in education, in healthcare, in energy, in sectors like that. And the countries, the societies that lead on those that find the way forward will literally open up new markets, create value, jobs, wealth and prosperity uh, that we haven't seen uh, to date. And so a liberal education provides for that opportunity to see the field, to find awareness, to have awareness, to see the gaps and the opportunities. A liberal arts education prepares a student to be a critical and analytical thinker for life, which is absolutely necessary for success in an ever-evolving world. Dr. King was a student of the classics whose liberal arts education equipped him to think outside the box. If the goal of his education had been merely career training, the civil rights movement might have never happened. In fact, he devised his plan to fight for civil rights non-violently after reading Gandhi during his education. Gandhi had devised his theory based upon reading the thoughts of another past philosopher, Thoreau, and his theory of civil disobedience. But I, 
remembered hearing a message by the president of Howard University, Dr. Mordecai Johnson, who had just returned from India. He spoke in Philadelphia on his trip to India and the whole philosophy of Gandhi and uh, passive and nonviolent resistance. Now, I was so deeply moved by the message that I went away and bought several books on the Gandhian, uh, on Gandhi and Gandhian technique. And at that point, I became deeply influenced by Gandhi, never realizing that uh, I would live in a situation where it would be useful and meaningful. And actually used it in, actually would apply it in yes, this country. That's right. History owes a debt to King's teachers who never asked, but when will he ever use Plato or Aristotle or Thoreau or Gandhi? His education was focused on teaching him to think, to aim for the true, the good, and the beautiful. It equipped him to change the world. It is not the exterior of a person that determines who they are. It is the roots laid that shapes their lives. Our teachers are the roots that shape the health of the tree, our very lives. <laughs>